There are many different kinds of dumb spirits. This is one kind here. A dumb spirit is the kind of a spirit that operates in, in uh, writing issues and operating in one channel and becomes excessive in the unnecessaries and becomes over, overwhelming in the incidentals and at the same time misses the whole point of the plan of God. This, man, this person had one kind of dumb spirit. But if you study the Word of God carefully and look up to the syntax in the Greek, you'll discover that there are many others, even as far back as Leviticus, other kinds of dumb spirits. So he brought his son who had a dumb spirit. Wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to the disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, he straightway, the spirit tear him, and he, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he answered, Of a child. And oft times it is to cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out, and he said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was one as, he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately. And they said, Why could not we cast him out? Why couldn't we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. He said, the only way that this kind can come out, and you notice it and notice it well tonight, and don't you ever forget it. In Mark, the ninth chapter and the twenty-ninth verse, Jesus said, you would never get this kind out. Never. You wouldn't, he said, unless it was by fasting and by prayer. So tonight, I'll be speaking upon this kind. This kind. What is it all about? This kind. Maybe it's the answer to hundreds of questions. Maybe it's the answer to thousands of seeming failures. And tonight I want to show you perhaps from the Word of God, hopefully, that we're going to enter into across our nation one of the greatest times that we've ever had against Satan and his forces. And believe me, beloved, we need to know how to pray and we need to know how to fast. It must be under the leadership of God and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But we must understand why we, why we should fast, what fasting does, and the true meaning of supplication and intercession. And as we understand that and walk holy unto God and walk in the living Spirit of Christ, many hundreds will be delivered because this kind comes out only by prayer and by fasting. Father, in a few moments from now as we preach this message tonight, we want you to do the ministry. So minister to our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. My father had a son who had a deaf and dumb spirit. He'd had this problem ever since he was a child. 
I wonder how many people are affected that way since they've been perhaps very small. And maybe they do not have a situation as nearly as serious as this man had with his son. But something happens when a child and it's never dealt with properly. It's never dealt with by the church. It's never dealt with by the counselor. It's never dealt with by the parents. I wonder how many people go through their lives absolutely in desperate need of deliverance. And even as their situation is covered up and misunderstood, and not evaluated properly, they go through life without deliverance. I realize that there are many problems that are congenital. And I realize that every situation certainly isn't because of demons. Nevertheless, many are. Many are. Not necessarily at all possession, but certainly obsession, influence, oppression, and so on. Probably more than we'd ever realize have some kind of an origin in the powers of darkness. The reason we believe that is because the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers against spiritual wickedness in high places. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For that reason, hundreds and thousands of people deal with the flesh when really it's principalities and powers behind the situation. Jesus was so quick to notice this. And there's a way by the grace of God that every child of God can know when it's demons and by God's grace when it's not demons. And they won't put a, a demon name on many things that aren't really demon caused, but they'll begin to understand and have the insight of Christ because of the filling of the Holy Spirit and the rich dwelling of the Word of God in their hearts. This man had a child that was deaf and dumb. Now, he did funny things. He would run for the water and try to drown himself. He would run for the fire and try to burn himself. The principle of these demons was to destroy him. Now, the demons operate in many different ways because there are many different demons. But their principle is to destroy. To destroy that that's living. To destroy life. Anyone that tries to destroy themselves or destroy others, it is always demonic-oriented. It's never anything but that. And any time destruction enters into the situation or the scene, it's because of the demons of destruction are operating either against the individual or against others through the individual. And that's what was happening here. He was trying to destroy himself. Some people try to destroy themselves by being alcoholics. Others try to destroy themselves by chain smoking. Others try to destroy themselves through lust and corrupt their minds and their hearts. Others try to destroy themselves through vain imaginations. Others try to destroy themselves just by being passive and callous and by criticizing and being judgmental. But there are many ways of destroying yourself that are much different than this young child. But the same principle is, is applied to the situation. And finally, they went to the disciples and the Word of God says, but they could not cast him out. They couldn't do it. They tried to, but they couldn't do it. How many times in 1972, 73 right now? Churches have prayed. We all have been a part of that and couldn't cast him out. Or we couldn't change the situation. It's unfortunate. Thank God for the many times that we have and as a body and for the many times we've experienced the victory of it. But many times, if we're honest, we have to face a situation and we look it squarely in the face and see that we've been defeated. We could not cast out the problem. We could not see the person delivered immediately the Lord Jesus Christ came by. The Father went to him and rushed to his side and he said, 
I have a son. Ever since he's been a child, he's cast himself into the water and into the fire. He foams at the mouth many times and gnashes with his teeth. And he said in so many words, Lord, would you help us and would you cast out the demons? And the Lord said to this generation, how long am I going to be with you and you're not going to understand? And he said, I believe, Lord. Jesus said, do you believe? He said, I believe. But he said, help my unbelief and have compassion on us. And the Word of God said that Jesus had compassion on him. The crowds began to come toward Jesus and Jesus immediate, immediately rebuked that spirit and told him not to enter into this child anymore. And he fell as one dead and then he thought that he was dead. And Jesus did not leave him in that condition as one that was dead. Now watch this. He took him by the hand and raised him up. Many times the church can cast out demons and get people delivered, but there's not the love and power of God to take him by the hand and to get life back in him. We get too petty, too legalistic. We want him something to happen so fast. We want him to change overnight into what it's taken us years to enter into, and we don't take the time to take him by the hand to lift him up. Jesus did. And Jesus lifted him up. The demons were gone. He was delivered. But he was still as one that was dead. Many, many people, after they've been delivered, will still be as one that's dead. They've got to learn a brand new life. But Jesus Christ didn't forsake him. He didn't say that just to go and leave him. He took him by the hand and raised him up. And immediately, it was beautiful and precious. The child was normal, and he began to live. The disciples took Jesus aside privately, and that's such a beautiful portion. If you've ever experienced a need in your life, you're going to experience it in the next few months and next few years, and you're going to see the tremendous need of really taking Jesus aside privately. I'm sure that you understand what I mean. But I mean really allow every single thing else to be out of your life but you and Christ alone. And I mean to take him aside. And they asked him a question. And they said, why couldn't we cast out the demons like you did? They took Jesus aside privately. Private conversations with Jesus get some good answers. And you'll receive good answers. And he received... And the disciples received some excellent answers whenever they did this. And this was one answer that they received. This kind can come out only by prayer and only by fasting. There is no other way. And that was the end of the scene. One sentence Jesus spoke to them. This kind can come out only by prayer and by fasting. Why is fasting important? First of all, fasting is important because when it's understood, understood scripturally, it means that by the grace of God that I take Jesus alone with me and Jesus takes me aside and I begin to put every single thing in my life in relationship to the sensitivity of His voice, of His Word, to the sensitivity of the test of prayer, to the sensitivity of every single thing that He teaches me in principle. And I get alone with Jesus and I begin to concentrate on letting Jesus Christ bring His perfect will, His perfect sensitive spirit as a preeminent power and person within me in every area of my human relationship and communication. It means that I begin to fast on specifics. And I begin to fast as God guides me and as God leads me for one purpose, that if there's any sin in my life, that God might reveal it to me and that I might instantly repent and forsake it, whatever it might be, at any cost. And by the grace of God, absolutely humble before God, 
get right in every single area. And then if that's not the reason I'm fasting, if by the grace of God I have a witness that I am totally right, then God allows me to enter into a divine concentration which will teach me the art of supplication and the art of intercession. Suppl supplication, as recorded in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, with, by prayer and supplication, let every request be made known unto God with thanksgiving, means to pray fervently and earnestly in importunity and to keep right on praying in importunity. But intercession means that I go to the throne of God and I pray something through until I get the answer. Prayer means that I ask and believe and maybe I leave it with God. But supplication means in fervency and earnestness I pray with importunity over something many times frequently. But intercession means that I go on praying and fasting in many cases until God gives me the answer to that prayer. I enter into godly and holy intercession. So Jesus said that the only way you're going to get this one is through intercession. And by the way, in Hebrews 7.26, which says, He ever liveth to make it intercession for us, it means that Jesus Christ never stops praying until the perfect answer comes and is experienced by the believer. That's what it means. That he never stops praying, that he ever liveth to make it intercession for us. And in Hebrews 9.24, pleading our case in 1 Timothy 2.5 as our mediator between God and between man and as the glorified priest, the high priest that takes us as priests of 1 Peter 2, 9, into the throne where we enter into prayer, supplication, and thirdly, intercession. I want you to see tonight something that we as a body must thoroughly understand. And listen to it carefully. There are many kinds that only comes by prayer and by fasting. The first one mentioned here is a dumb spirit. A dumb spirit is a spirit outside of God's love and outside of God's life. A dumb spirit is a criticizing spirit. A dumb spirit is a spirit that goes to the tree of knowledge and rationalizes by sight or judges motives. A dumb spirit is a lusting spirit. A dumb spirit is a lying spirit. A dumb spirit is a lazy spirit. A dumb spirit is a crooked spirit. A dumb spirit is a spirit that does things to their body that's detrimental and destructive. destructive. And yet when they're told and when it's proven by the medical profession and by common sense that it's, that it's not right, they go right on doing it. It's a dumb spirit. It's not of God. It's dumb. It's a spirit that doesn't pray. It's a spirit that when God says, be ye reconciled to me and to your family, it refuses to be reconciled. It's a spirit that is dumb because it doesn't have the common sense to know divine intelligence and to know the revelation of the Word of God and to experience the life and order of Jesus Christ through the Spirit and through the Scriptures. A dumb spirit is a wife that rebels against her husband when the Word of God says she can win him by her conversation. A dumb spirit is a husband that reacts and rebels against his wife when he's got God and prayer and the Word and the Spirit and the life of Jesus Christ inside him to be a victorious throne uh, winner and to be able to initiate heaven on earth to her and have it be a precious mission field and an opportunity and a glorious privilege. But when he doesn't do that, he has a dumb spirit. He has a dumb spirit when he doesn't try to heal the situation. She has a dumb spirit when she doesn't submit to the healing. Dumb spirits are spirits that don't have the Holy Spirit operating at the core of their existence. How many understand that? A dumb spirit is a spirit that can't go to another brother of whom you dislike and say, I love you and minister life to them. A dumb spirit is a spirit that degrades or discredits the Holy Spirit. Now, I can degrade or discredit the Holy Spirit if I have him by grieving him in Ephesians 4.30, by quenching him in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
verse 20, 19 and 21, or by resisting him in Acts 7.53. Now, if I do this to the Holy Spirit, that's a dumb spirit or another spirit that refuses to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal God in the situation. So any spirit that refuses to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal God and Christ and His love and His character and His patience and His peace and His joy and His deliverance power in every any situation, any spirit that's not available to the Holy Spirit in the situation where a Christian is, is, is a, also a dumb spirit. How many understand it? And dumb spirits usually set in the human, the human soul and biologically and physiologically in the human computer and down through the human soul back when the human spirit was dead. They usually come in before salvation and they leave the person totally and completely confused and then the person gets saved and never does get his dumb spirit dealt with. He, he makes a decision and goes back on his decision. Then he rationalizes as a tree of knowledge. He floats around. He goes around the cycle of the wilderness, not ever entering into Canaan. He never goes down into the Jordan River. There's a dumb spirit that makes him murmur, complain, rationalize. He criticizes success. And then when something happens, he's glad it happens because it's a dumb spirit. It's not the spirit of the living God. Let me show it to you now from the Scripture. In Joel chapter 1 and verse 14, Joel called a solemn fast for the whole nation. And he said, I call a solemn fast that you all might gather together and fast before God. In the second chapter, in the twelfth verse, he says, I want you to repent of your sins because judgment is coming. And he said, I want you to fast and mourn and weep and fast. And he said, because judgment is coming. He said, blow the trumpet. I want a solemn fast. In verse 15 of chapter 2, he said, I want our nation to be purged of sin. I want our nation to learn how to deal directly with God and receive direct, holy, powerful answers in the Word of God. He said, fast. Ezra, the 10th chapter and the 6th verse, went into the room and he fasted and prayed and mourned and fasted some more. And he said, we are a sinful nation. And he fasted, but Ezra did something else. He fasted and prayed because people were carried away into captivity. And he wept and fasted for the people that was carried away. He, was, he did not criticize. He did not criticize. He didn't judge. He fasted in a room and wept and prayed for people that were carried away in Ezra 10, 6, but he didn't judge. He didn't criticize. He didn't evaluate. He just fasted and prayed and wept for them. How many understand it? Ezra, the Holy Spirit. Modern day Pharisees, a dumb spirit. The next thing I want you to see is how beautiful and how precious fasting and prayer can be. Daniel, in the 10th chapter, in the 3rd verse, says this, as he was in a vision, I ate no pleasant food. And he said, wine didn't come into my mouth, ne neither did I anoint myself for three full weeks. Daniel fasted and prayed for 21 full days. At the end of the 21 days, the servant of God saw, of course, this tremendous vision. Someone came to him in linen. It was an angel. And it said, Daniel, your beloved, with a man of great understanding. And it said, your beloved, Daniel. Daniel fasted and prayed for 21 days. And, and, and the angel came and said, your beloved of God, and you have great understanding. And then all of a sudden, beautifully, as Daniel was in his fast and prayer, God said to him in the 12th verse, I'm going to give you uh, the future of your people, the end times of your people, and you're not even going to understand it, but I'm going to give you the end time. Fasting and prayer brought Daniel a revelation of our day right on key, the 70th week of Daniel, which hasn't started yet, but will the first Saturday the Jews worship God in in their temple, but it hasn't started yet because of Luke 21, 24. This is the time of the Gentiles. And Daniel got a vision of our time, but it was sealed to him. Why? Because he fasted and prayed. He was open to the Holy Spirit of God. And the Bible says that when the angel came, the earthquake, and all the people that were with Daniel, 
didn't even see the angel and didn't even hear his voice. They were hid because they ran because of the quake. But only Daniel did because he was fasting and praying. How many understand it? In First Samuel, the ninth chapter, and the Word of God says in the seventh verse that Samuel took his people into Mizpah and he took them in and he said, Listen, the Philistines are upon us. He said, fast and pray. And they said, cry unto God for us. And they fasted and they prayed and they wept. And in the ninth verse of the ninth chapter, the Word of God says, God has heard you have victory over the Philistines. How did it come? By fasting and praying and crying unto God. How many understand it? In the New Testament, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, in verses 1 and 2, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And there he fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. The Word of God says in Exodus 34, verse 28, that Moses fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. Neither food came into his mouth nor water into his soul. And he got the Ten Commandments from God. And he brought it to the Israelites after fasting and prayer. The Word of God teaches that... Uh, in, in Jesus, when he fasted and prayed, that he was hungry, literally hungry, but he fasted and prayed, and he was led by the Spirit to face the devil. And by the grace of God, he faced the devil with the Word of God and was victor and never did yield to one single sin in the most unique temptation and trial of human history because he fasted and prayed. The Word of God says in Paul in, in Acts 9, verse 9, when his eyes was, were blind for three days and three nights, he didn't eat and he didn't drink. And then God led him after fasting and prayer and he was healed. And 10.30 reiterates it. The Word of God says in Acts 13 verses 1 and 2 that the New Testament church ministered unto the Lord and fasted. And then the Word of God says again in verse 2, they fasted and prayed. And then the Holy Spirit says, send out Paul and Barnabas and they laid their hands on them and fasted and sent them out for the first missionary journey. How did it come about? By ministering to the Lord, by fasting to the Lord, and then fasting in prayer, and then they got the names that were to be sent out. Then they sent them out with the church, fasting and praying. The Word of God says in Luke 14, 23, that when Paul and Barnabas were ordaining elders in every city, before they ordained the elders, they fasted and prayed and committed each one by name unto the Lord. How many understand? I want you to see tonight the importance of fasting and prayer. Some of God's people here right now are in fasting and prayer and will be indefinitely until God says no. That doesn't make them any more spiritual. One must be led by God. We fasted and prayed. The week that that miracle happened in Wiscasset we were fasting, some of us, and praying when that miracle took, miracle took place. We were fasting and praying the week that we needed $22,000 another time and it came in the very week of fasting and prayer. We prayed and fasted that God would lead us into His perfect will for this building and He brought us here. We prayed and fasted that God would work a miracle last week and in four days we heard details on the situation that we haven't heard for weeks by them contacting us. We fasted and prayed on another issue and again another situation opened right up. Many of these kinds will only come by prayer and by fasting and by people getting a hold of God in a vertical relationship where everything that surrounds them is Jesus Christ where their heart beats with compassion, where their desire is unique, where their spiritual hunger after the Word is multiplied by the Holy Spirit living inside their soul and completely taking over. No longer do they waste words. No longer are they living in defeat and murmuring and, and living at the tree of knowledge. They've learned how to every time they meet to get a hold of God and say, Lord, meet us in this meeting 
talk to us in this meeting, speak to us in this situation. And Lord Jesus, we want You to move. And then by the grace of God in Mark 11:22, the Word of God says that whatsoever things you desire, you shall receive. And if you say unto this mountain, Be removed, mountain, and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in your heart, that mountain shall be removed. God wants us as a corporate body. God wants us to be able to, re to move some mountains. The mountains that sinners are hung up on is taking them to hell so that scores of them will be saved and born again and washed in the blood and their ears will be opened to the Holy Spirit as we rebuke the dumb spirits through prayer even though we're not with them. The mountains and obstacles that are keeping them in hang-ups and keeping them in, in defeat and frustration. We ought to be able to remove the mountains where people have habits that they can't kick through prayer and fasting, through love and through compassion and through walking in the Spirit of God. Some of you have hang-ups that you've had for years and you try to rally at times, but you don't really understand intercession. Interceding until that victory comes like the young person of 21 years of age that got down on her knees in prayer in her community because it never had a live church and she stayed with God for hours. She fasted. She carried on her duties with her husband and respected and honored Him in her home to satisfy Him completely. But every moment she got, she fasted and prayed with His permission and she went to fast and pray and she stayed with it going on to 11 days and then God sent a knock on her door and a preacher came to her door and he was God's man for that area. And she had been fasting and praying and going on to 11 days. And the moment that she saw his face, though she'd never met him, she knew that she and God had a fellowship, had a vertical relationship that couldn't be broken and souls were saved in that community year after year all because of one woman that doesn't want her name to be given ever that fasted and prayed for 11 days and she got a hold of God in a fast and a prayer. Another couple that weren't getting along that tried for counseling for years took the advice of the counselor and went into fasting and prayer and their fourth day they began to realize the answers and the problems were solved and they came together and for 18 months their relationship has been uniquely beautiful because together they fasted and prayed and sought the will of God and sought the face of God and sought the mind of God and received the presence and power of God in fasting and prayer. This kind can only come out by prayer and fasting and by the grace of God on that Wednesday night we hadn't seen a soul for saved in our ministry for two solid weeks in, in evangelism and we gathered on a Wednesday night for prayer and fasting that day and that night and prayed all that night and one of the greatest joys that I ever received no soul saved for over two complete weeks and after one night of fasting and prayer and one day 28 professions the next night walked the aisle in three minutes and I realized the value of prayer and fasting how many understand it? Listen, I want you to see tonight that there is a way. There are many ways that God uses to overcome things. Prayer does it. Many times, thank God for prayer. Then supplication. He takes us into supplication. Importunity in prayer. And then intercession, which includes fasting and not quitting until the answer comes. If God has laid that upon the individual's heart, this kind only comes by prayer and fasting. I wonder if all the born-again believers in America, of all the denominations in all the churches, I mean truly born-again Christians, I don't mean an ecumenical thing. I'm talking about true, twice-born, blood-bought believers got together in their local areas and never mind denominational barriers and never mind doctrinal difference but those that have been born again of the Spirit and of the Word of God and started to fast and to pray and say to God, we're not going to quit until we hear from heaven. We're not going to quit until our problems and differences have been resolved. 
We're not going to quit until we see the fire of God and the power of God come down and the love of God come in, spiritually speaking, and move our hearts in a scriptural way. God, we're just going to fast and pray. We're not going to let Satan win a victory and have these hang-ups. We're not going to. We're going to be free to see God. God moved to see the Holy Spirit motivate, to see the Word of God reveal this realities, and we're not going to, let alone people in different communities, maybe that won't happen. Thank God it's happened in Korea. Thank God it's happened in Western Canada. Thank God it did happen in Indonesia, but maybe it won't happen. I do not know. We can only hope and pray that it will, but if that won't happen... God needs a group of Christians, regardless of their affiliations, that are born again, that will sacrifice to come together and fast and pray in halls and places to begin to move God in, and to move Him through by being submissive and humble and open and letting Jesus Christ be filled in their hearts with the Holy Spirit and letting Jesus Christ completely take over. God only knows the kind of trouble that we have in America, the kind of hang-ups that we have in Christianity, many of them are only going to come out through fasting and through prayer. This kind, Jesus said, can only come by fasting and prayer. How oh, some of you people go your ways with your selfishness, with your greed, with your lust, anything outside of God's will, with your own personal ideas, with your own natural temperaments, with your own discouragement and depressions and uh, disagreements, you should be on your knees and learn how to fast and learn how to pray and learn to turn your spirit, soul, and body over to God and be filled with the grace and love and holiness of God, the righteousness of God that reveals sin. Any sin in your life, any sin in my life should be named, confessed, and repented of and anything that's of a dumb spirit is sin. Anything that isn't of the Holy Spirit that isn't of God, that doesn't have the intensity of God's ideas, that doesn't have the core of God's heart, that doesn't have the blueprint of God's plan, that doesn't have the purpose of God's thinking, that doesn't have the knowledge of God's wisdom, that doesn't have the grace of God's love. Anything outside of God is sin, whatever it is, and sin must be confessed and dealt with and repented of so the Holy Spirit of the living God can take us and fill us with Jesus Christ and give us a hunger for the Word of God and take away any hang-up. For example, no matter what the story is, God should move. I told the kids this and I'll say it tonight. If when you were a young person, if when you decided to grow long hair, if that was done out of rebellion, then you should have your hair completely cut and repent because it was done in rebellion. Whatever it is, Whatever it is, whatever habit, whatever custom, whatever it is, the big reason it should be done is because of the hot attitude that took you in it. It should be repented and forsaken. And even if God gave you the grace to do it later, in, to some degree, at least it should be totally repented of because that's what repentance is. It's repenting of every single thing that where I rebelled against God in a total, complete swap around and going the other way. No matter what it is, it's going to cost us something to have revival. The first thing is it's going to consume your life. It's going to take away your Adam nature totally and completely. Oh, I don't mean in eradication, but I mean practically speaking. Sin will have no dominion. And it means tonight that it, most of all and where it starts, it affects our heart, it affects our soul, our mind, our thinking. It cleans us up inside and gives us a brand new heart for God, a brand new desire to pray and study, a brand new desire to go all the way with Jesus Christ, to love Him to cherish Him, to fellowship with Him, just to have a good time fellowshipping and serving God and to be able to enter into liberation and liberty and joy and peace within that can only come from God and a cleansed and clean and purged heart. That's where it starts. Inside, outside, things are of no value unless it changes the inside of man. And the inside of man is 
where it starts and then it works its way out where you're humble, where you're obedient, where you realize that by the grace of God, God wants you to be a new creature with divine design, with a divine look, with a divine attitude, with a divine te a temperament and with a divine appearance. God wants your countenance and He wants you to be entirely new in Jesus Christ. He wants to change you inside out and outside in. And then as we fast and as we pray and as we believe God to enter into the power of being brand new creatures in Jesus Christ, brand new, listen, whatever it is, Whatever it is, because the Holy Spirit is inside. Things should drop off on the outside. I shouldn't have to argue. I shouldn't have to rationalize. I shouldn't have to ask others. They should go because I have a living God inside. And I realize that I, through the Holy Spirit, I want to be the best possible testimony in the world for Jesus Christ without a question. Inside I'm clean. Outside I'm clean. And by the grace of God, I can get a hold of God. And when I have something... There's a need for others and a need for the world. Then I can pray. And God has promised as we do this as a body, as Christianity does this, that God will come down and change and correct situations and bring revival individually, corporately, in, in the community and in the church of the living God, wherever this is allowed, through the precious Holy Spirit and through the Word of God. How many understand that? People that want revival don't argue revival. They don't argue on the small things. They're so hungry. They're so sick and tired of superficiality. They're so sick and tired of half-baked Christianity. They're so sick and tired of prayer meetings where five or six comes and nothing happens. Now, thank God, many times five or six can come and change the world. I'm not looking at numbers. But they're so sick and tired of the trends. They're so sick and tired of this denomination thinking it's the only one in the world and then this one over here and then a group gets independent and they think they're the only ones in the world and on and on it goes and any one of us can be swept into it. Listen, people are sick and tired of the hypocrisy, of the, of the confusion, of the deception that's in circles today and the only way we're going to be able to sense God and sense His blessing and enter into a fresh experience of revival is by coming to God in prayer, in fasting, in contrition, in, in, in humility and be willing to totally repent of anything and everything and raise your hand and say, God, move me. Take over and give in to God and let Jesus Christ be Lord and God and Almighty in our life and let the Holy Spirit lead us and repent of anything that used to be a cause of rebellion and repent and change through the grace of God's Word and through the power of Jesus Christ. This guy, that was a dumb spirit is represented today by many other spirits that are dumb. And a dumb spirit is a spirit that isn't holy. That isn't holy. This was a certain kind of a dumb spirit. Listen, you have the Holy Spirit if you're saved and born again tonight. And if you walk out of here knowing that you're deliberately disobeying God in an area that's a dumb Spirit. But if you walk out of here tonight, and by the grace of God, if you have to go to a phone, repent on the phone, write a letter, or whatever it is in your life, and you change, and the Holy Spirit changes you, then that's revival for you, and that's the Holy Spirit. Just that simple. And then tomorrow to walk in the same attitude as you study and pray and fulfill your responsibility in your job or wherever God has placed you. It's just that simple. It's doing what, is, what God says is right. And that's what revival is. Obeying the Word and obeying the Spirit together. That's what revival is. How many understand? I want you to see in closing tonight that many kinds are not going to come but by prayer and fasting. Why? Because God wants your special attention. And God wants a special audience with you. And He doesn't want it just at a service only. And He doesn't want it just when you decide to have a good hour with Him. 
God has times that He created the universe, He's redeemed you, He sustains you, and God wants your special attention, and God wants you to be His special audience, and prayer and fasting is one move and one way and one method He gets it. He wants you to just be for Him for a while, and He wants just to be for you, and He wants nothing else in between when He can talk to you, when He can show you things that He hasn't been able to show you, when He can help you in areas that He hasn't been able to help you, when He can give you burdens that He hasn't been able to give to you. He just wants you set aside with prayer and fasting, not a lot of talking, but a lot of listening, not a lot of murmuring, but a lot of praying, not a lot of jesting, but a lot of holiness in its place. God just wants you to be for Him, and He wants you to be His audience, and He wants you to have special attention with Him to get certain things in prayer and fasting. Bow your heads and close your eyes.